shall I start now? Uh, okay, uh, hi folks, uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, sorry for the, the technical uh, issue we had. Uh, we had some issues in live streaming this to uh, YouTube from uh, our Zoom, it went to a different channel. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, yeah, so thanks for joining in. Uh, I'm Prabhas Srivadhan uh, from WSO2. Uh, hope all of you are doing good and uh, staying safe. Uh, so staying safe is the, uh, the most important thing. Uh, most of our engineers uh, uh, at WSO2, they are still uh, working from home. And uh, we recently opened our offices in, in Colombo, uh, but just for a limited set of people. And uh, that's uh, in, in Colombo, in fact, uh, the COVID-19 situation is uh, under, under control. Uh, but still, I guess 90% uh, of our engineers, uh, they still work from home. Uh, with me today, uh, we have a set of engineers from uh, Identity Server team joining in, and uh, some of them will uh, take turns to share the experience at some point uh, during the, the call today. Uh, yeah, so you know that this event uh, is live stream on YouTube. Uh, and uh, so we shared, like if you are on the previous channel, uh, you would see the link uh, in the description. And probably let me uh, tweet the new link as well. Uh, let me tweet the new one. Uh, so new one should be this. Okay. And uh, so this is our Slack channel. I think if you shared the uh, the latest link there too. Uh, so if you are new to the Slack channel, uh, you can find an invitation here. If you go to IES community call uh, meeting notes, uh, there you can find uh, a link to the Slack channel invitation. I, I, I'll post this link to the uh, YouTube uh, video description. And uh, if you are new to, new to identity server, you can go here and find uh, the identity server, the product page, you can download uh, our latest distribution. And I guess uh, most of you are in this call uh, are familiar with this. Yeah, and also you can uh, subscribe to our Twitter account. This is identity server IAM community Twitter account. Uh, so we share uh, latest updates, uh, latest uh, milestone releases, blogs, uh, via this uh, Twitter channel. And then uh, I aggregate all the blogs uh, our team writes here. If you go to 2020 uh, link, uh, so this includes all the blogs we wrote this year. Uh, this month, in fact, we haven't written that much uh, blogs, seven blogs altogether. So mostly due to like, uh, since uh, end of last month, uh, like the team, team was on, uh, on like very busy schedule, like we had to work on um, some analyst work and uh, we were working on our release as well as, uh, so we are working on our cloud deployment. So a lot of stuff came uh, <laughs> last a uh, few weeks. So I think uh, we didn't find that much time to blog, but hopefully we'll catch up in, in next month. I picked few blogs to uh, talk about. Uh, all the blogs that we have written, they are interesting and uh, very uh, useful one. Once uh, here I picked uh, five blocks out of that. Uh, if you look at the first one, this is written by uh, Coogan. So here he talks about how you can use uh, the VS Code plugin uh, to uh, write uh, uh, adapt to authentication scripts and uh, push those to uh, Git and then that server will pick it from Git and enforce. And also you can use uh, VS Code to uh, debug uh, the adaptive authentication script in IES. Uh, we introduced uh, this JavaScript based uh, 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 adaptive authentication script since IES uh, 570, uh, maybe a couple of years back now, end of 2018, I guess. Uh, and this has been a very uh, like powerful feature in IES since then. And uh, the focus is uh, uh, to, to make it more developer friendly, build more tooling around this. So, VS Code plugin is one of them. And we also plan to build more plugins like Atom plugin and uh, so idea plugins, those stuff uh, in our roadmap. 
then uh, the next blog written by uh, Gangani. Uh, so here she talks about how to do a cumulative risk-based adaptive authentication with IES. Once again, uh, how you build this is through uh, the adaptive authentication script. Uh, so it's a JavaScript you need to write. Uh, here uh, we do two things. So we are using uh, our own uh, CD engine as uh, our uh, risk engine. CD as our risk engine. Here from this uh, adaptive authentication, adaptive authentication script, we uh, feed uh, some signals to the risk engine. Like so, whenever there's a fail login attempts or else when uh, we identify it's a new device login, then we feed those signals to the uh, uh, risk engine. And the CID risk engine can get uh, signals from other sources as well. And based on those signals, it will uh, calculate a risk score. So here you can see uh, the algorithm that uh, or the logic uh, we define in CID. And then Adinser will read that uh, risk score and based on that risk score, we'll decide how you want to authenticate the user. For example, if the risk score is greater than seven, then we treat that as a high high risk uh, score and we suspend login. So it's it's uh, up to you how you want to configure this one. Then if it is medium risk, we'll go to step three. So in step three, you can define any like uh, authenticator you need. For example, it can be FIDO. And if it is low risk, probably we go to uh, OTP. And so this is once again, very, a powerful way of uh, uh, controlling access to your service providers based on different factors. Then uh, this blog written by Ishara, once again, very informative one. He talks about uh, open standards and open source. Uh, so basically it says open source, open standard itself doesn't uh, save you from vendor locking. Uh, open standard uh, helps you to build interoperability between different systems. Uh, in fact, a uh, couple of years back, uh, Ian Glazer from Salesforce did a nice talk at uh, EIC, European Identity Conference. Uh, he talked about uh, the TCP IP moment in identity. Uh, if you look at, like, if you go back a couple of decades, TCP IP was a luxury. Like, so if you have any software and you can advertise that it supports uh, TCP IP and it gave you a competitive advantage. But today we never worry about TCP IP support, right? So whenever we get a software, we buy software, we never even ask whether the, that software supports TCP IP because it's given that any uh, software out there should support TCP IP. What uh, Ian Glazer arg argued in that talk was now we see the TCP IP moment in identity. That means any identity product should support open standards. And that will like just just having support for open standards won't uh, won't add any competitive advantage to your product. Uh, even today, we see some in, in some RFIs and RFPs there are requirements like questions asking uh, asking support uh, for this uh, open standard. But we hope these things will go away and every product out there will support for these open standards. Uh, but Ishara's argument here is uh, just supporting open standards won't save you from vendor locking because like uh, we don't know how uh, the system is built, right? So they may have the open standard interfaces, but uh, you can get locked into the code, like how you execute, uh, like how you implement this open standard. So that's why his argument is like, so if you want to get true vendor locking, uh, non-vendor locking experience, then you need to uh, worry about both open standards and open source. Then uh, this is a blog written by Pulasti. So here he talks about uh, how you can monitor identity server held with Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, here you can see uh, uh, we have configured uh, this uh, JMS exporter agent uh, from Prometheus in identity server. Then this will ex uh, expose an endpoint to Prometheus. Then you configure Prometheus to read from this endpoint. Uh, to, uh, to scrape uh, these logs. So basically here we are exposing JVM metrics and then you use Grafana to read data from uh, Prometheus and uh, build dashboards. It's another uh, very nice blog. And uh, finally, Ayesha has written a blog on uh, migrating users in an existing IAM system to identity server. So this is uh, once again, a very uh, frequent frequent question we hear from our customers. 
uh, like so whenever we go to a customer uh, it's not a like green field we have to work with uh, they have legacy systems they have customers coming from different places uh, so uh, the challenge we see is how how we can uh, come up with a phased approach to migrate the existing customers to new uh, new system so here uh, aisha uh, discusses few approaches like so if you want to uh, migrate users with passwords you can do that like you can just export password hashes or else you can do just in time provision you can keep your existing system for some time and then uh, in phases you can migrate them uh, this is once again a very complicated area and we need to uh, evaluate uh, case by cases to come up with the best approach and couple of upcoming events so open source iam value benefit and risk uh, it's on 7th uh, july uh, ishar and dulange presenting there and we also have a meetup coming up on uh, 2nd july uh, it's not announced yet, probably by tomorrow i'll announce that so there we are going to talk about uh, secret grpc traffic uh, with istio Yes, I think uh, with that, uh, I'll hand over to Maliti. Uh, so Maliti will talk about like what we are doing at the moment in IES, especially uh, what are the new new features we are expecting in IES file uh, now. Over to you, Maliti. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so shall I share my screen? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hope you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we can see it, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, greetings to everybody. Uh, so, I'm Mari Pietri Singh. So, I've been working with Titan Server team for nearly six years now. Uh, yeah, so without... Uh, Mari, it seems uh, still it's not in the... Uh, it's there, it's there, it's there. All right, okay. sorry, I'm a bit delayed. Okay. Okay, uh, so uh, let's quickly look into what are the new features we have with Titan Server uh, 5.11.0, uh, which is to be uh, released uh, nearly by uh, end of August, uh, sorry, end of, uh, yeah, end of August and early September timelines. So, uh, so I think like uh, we already discussed this uh, with our uh, previous community call as well as Ishara uh, talk about uh, our roadmap and all. Uh, so basically uh, our main theme for our first two quarters uh, was on like uh, improving the user experience. Uh, basically uh, improving the end user experience and uh, identity admin experience and specifically uh, with more focus on improving the developer experience. So uh, with that, like uh, uh, we started with 590 where we released our uh, REST-based uh, product APIs. And then with 510 we uh, released a brand new user portal. And uh, so what's new with 5110 is actually there are two, port two more portals coming up the developer portal and the admin portal. So this is actually the project dashboard uh, that we maintain for identify file on zero. So also you can, uh, if you go to uh, GitHub and uh, look at our WS organization, you will find it there as well. Uh, and like, uh, as you know, so uh, this uh, developer portal, admin portal, uh, user portal, so all these, uh, single page, uh, React based single page applications and uh, which are, which can be in de independently deployable. And uh, they actually, we are using OpenID Connect uh, to provide authentication for those portals, uh, adhering to single page application best practices, uh, such as like uh, we, uh, we have a token bounded for the cookie, uh, avoiding uh, token hijacking with the cross site scripting stuff and uh, also like uh, we are we are storing this token with uh, browsing memory storage uh, with the uh, web worker api uh, spawning web worker threads so specifically like if you want to know more about that uh, i think so prabhat did a 
uh, meet up on this uh, on securing single page applications uh, where he talks more on like uh, what are the strategies uh, we followed on securing uh, the single page applications we implemented so uh, i think you can find that over this uh, channel as well and uh, yeah so again coming back to what we have new uh, so uh, as i said we have uh, three uh, two new portals so let's look at what uh, what is available with the developer portal yes so uh, in developer portal so we are mainly focusing on uh, developers who are coming to the coming to the admin server to configure their, their applications and uh, provide uh, to to have uh, authentication and authorization uh, uh, defined for their applications and uh, so specifically like we have uh, two main features the application management and the identity provider management so this is pretty much same uh, with uh, pretty much same on what we had with the management console with respect to configuring applications uh, basically you can define the uh, 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 claim mappings and uh, role mappings uh, map claims from sp to uh, sp to the idp and uh, similarly roles as well as authentication scripts strong authentication so and so so what's new is the ux and additionally so what we have uh, improved uh, mostly is now we have a set of predefined templates so that means now if you want to if you are looking in, on configuring your uh, single page application or you are looking on configuring your mobile application so you can easily se select the like click on the on configuring a single page application and the developer portal will take you on a journey on easily configuring your single page application or mobile application so that's what new with this uh, developer portal and additionally like uh, we also have a help panel so which assists the user as he configures his uh, application so with the help panel uh, as you configure your application you will be able to see that uh, uh, you will be able to uh, download the sdks for your application uh, suppose you are configuring a mobile one so you can download the mobile sdk and uh, start uh, configuring uh, that with your application as well as it will guide you like uh, it will have the sample if you want to uh, start quickly uh, and a relevant guide on how you can uh, configure your application easily so that's what we are what we have with the developer portal so possibly like in a later community call we can show you a comprehensive demo on these portals uh, similarly we have identity provider management so here again uh, we have almost all we had with our previous management console so even here what's new is the user experience and the default templates you have such that you can easily configure like you can uh, go and easily pick google and configure your google idp facebook azure etc uh, so that's what we have with the uh, developer portal. So if we look into admin portal, um, so admin portal has almost other management capabilities like uh, user management, then uh, certificate management uh, and then attribute management. Basically, this is what we referred as claim management previously, uh, where you can uh, map your user store attributes to WSO2 internal attributes or claims. And uh, again, you can map those back to external dialects like scheme, open ID connect, et cetera. Uh, yeah, and one thing I missed is like uh, actually, so, uh, for all these single page applications uh, to uh, to cater the single logout capability, we are actually using OpenID Connect session management. 
And from admin portal, we have user store management. Uh, then uh, in configuration, server configurations, we have uh, all account management policies, login policies uh, that were already available in the product. And we have group management capabilities where you can uh, associate your user group, user and group relationships. And then we have role management. So uh, where you can uh, allow your users, uh, uh, allow your users uh, the access you have, you can give to like to connect to the admin portal and what they actually you can define what they can do in your admin portal, uh, developer portal, etc. Uh, managing uh, internal roles. Uh, and associating those roles to users or uh, groups that you bring in. So that's what we have with the admin portal. And uh, let's look at uh, what we have done uh, in perspective of uh, uplifting the developer experience. Yeah, so most of our uh, most of these are still going on. And uh, we have a set of SDKs and samples like uh, uh, which will enable uh, developers who are coming to uh, configure their applications uh, to easily configure them uh, with the identity server. So basically uh, all these samples and SDKs uh, will be available in the side panel of the developer portal ultimately with an application template in the developer portal uh, where you can uh, easily start configuring a specific application type. So yeah, we have a mobile sample uh, for Android and an Android SDK. Then we will have a, a Spring Boot application sample and uh, uh, how we can easily connect a Spring Boot application with the identity server. Then we will have a Windows desktop application sample, uh, a .NET SDK, uh, and uh, JavaScript and React-based single page application sample as well. So this SDK is the one we're actually uh, using with our single page applications uh, also. So additionally, so we will have some tooling uh, that will help uh, developers to uh, uh, like debug their authentication flow. So this is what uh, Prabhat also talked about previously. So uh, with 5.11.0, we have a VS Code plugin. So uh, Kugan has, write, uh, has written a nice blog on that. So let me take you to uh, some video here. Yeah. Uh, so basically this VS Code plugin is capable of like, uh, uh, so this explains clearly uh, how you can install the plugin uh, with your VS Code and how you can connect with the identity server. So this is capable of like uh, pulling service provider artifacts and uh, you will be, uh, you can list all service providers here and uh, for each you will, it will show you a visual diagram on like uh, what, what, what kind of authentication flow it has. And uh, as at now, what we support is uh, like uh, for SAML and OpenID Connect flows, uh, we uh, have support to debug the endpoint and the exit point. Basically, the SAML request, the SAML response, and uh, uh, also the authorization uh, or OpenID Connect request and responses. Uh, so that's what we have right now, but we are planning to improve this more. Uh, uh, to like uh, enable you to debug the uh, authentication scripts you write, uh, as well as uh, other checkpoints of the authentication flow. So uh, that's what we have with the VS Code plugin. And yeah, and the other one is uh, from the VS Code itself, we uh, uh, enables to like manage the service providers, service provider artifacts in Git where you can easily update your service pro uh, provider from the 
VS code and push it to Git so that the identity server will pick it and uh, get it deployed. So, uh, so this will like uh, eventually like we are uh, improving this as well in order to like uh, uh, enable you to have a full CI CD pipeline for service providers and we will uh, have the uh, same case for the identity providers and other artifacts uh, we have in identity server as well. So that's what we have uh, with respect to developer experience and uh, I will talk now about what are the improvements we have uh, uh, in identity foresight. Yes, so as explained, so there are a couple of uh, REST APIs uh, which has been added um, in IS file on zero as well with respect to developer portal and admin portal uh, functionalities. Uh, so what's important, uh, what are the important features are like uh, previously we had only uh, Asymmetric encryption uh, to encrypt our uh, sensitive data. So we were using actually asymmetric en encryption previously. So with file eleven zero, uh, we have brought in uh, symmetric encryption option. So now uh, sensitive data uh, of the identity server uh, that uh, runtime data we have, uh, any configuration data and those stuff will be. Uh, encrypted with symmetric encryption and the data key will be a symmetric key and we will use envelope encryption to protect that data key. So by default, uh, that data key will be protected uh, from our uh, default primary key store, which is uh, over asymmetric encryption so that uh, uh, you can rotate that key, key without impacting uh, the internal data. And uh, uh, additionally, you also have the capability to like uh, protect this uh, data key uh, with some key management service. Uh, so that's coming with IS 511.0. And uh, we have the group and role separation. So this is what I talked previously. Uh, uh, we will have uh, groups that uh, represent a user group relationship and roles uh, uh, with which you can uh, define the accessibility for the uh, developer admin portals. Uh, and you can assign those roles to either groups or users. Then uh, we are also working on qualifying all identity server endpoints with tenant. So this is some uh, Thing that uh, so basically like previously in our uh, previous versions we were actually identifying the tenant uh, either from the like uh, service provider or as the user authenticates from the user realm or like we have a query from uh, for to identify tenant domain so that's how we identify tenant domain so now we have brought in uh, defining tenant in the context itself in the url context which helps move with branding use cases so uh, however like for file 11 so, so this is a feature actually we are working on and for file 11 zero we will only have the uh, core endpoints uh, tenant qualified so this will not be like uh, uh, a production ready one. Uh, so basically, uh, we will be improving, adding the other uh, stuff uh, for the next release actually. Uh, and uh, another thing is like uh, we had uh, brought in like uh, cross origin resource sharing configurations to tenant level. And another major thing is the open SAML upgrade. So uh, this had been something that lacked due to the complexity of the upgrade, but uh, uh, for 5.11.0, we, we were able to get it done, uh, thanks to the HAMI. Uh, so, uh, so basically, OpenSAML was like uh, reached end of license few years back, but uh, 
with 510, we have upgraded it to OpenSAML 3. So that's what we have with the identity core. Yeah, I think uh, I covered pretty much most of the features we have, important stuff. Uh, and yes, few more we will be working on like uh, supporting multiple logging identifiers. So uh, we had this support for LDAP, but uh, not for JDBC user stores. Like basically like uh, this use case uh, was uh, possible with the identity server. May, you might have to have some extensions to the login portal or the authenticators, but uh, from 5.11.0, we are planning to provide the first class support for this feature. Uh, that's what we have uh, new for 5.11.0. Yeah, any questions? So any, any uh, idea on the release date, Maliti? Uh... Yeah, I think I mentioned, right? So basically, like, as you see, uh, so most of our features are done uh, and uh, at the at the end stages. So we are planning to pre-solve the feature, uh, in feature uh, implementations by end of July. And uh, by end of August, we are planning on our release. Okay, great, yeah. Yeah, I think we uh, don't have any questions on the, the chat panel and probably we can move the next one. Uh, Isura, uh, are you ready? Uh, yes, bro. Yeah, shall I share my screen? Yeah, please, yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, yeah, we can, we can see it now, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks Prabhat. So yeah, in this session actually, so I'm going to discuss about, so how to working with the REST APIs in the IMSA. Uh, yeah, so we have two sessions regarding this. Uh, so I am, I am, I will be doing uh, the authentication and authorization part, the security of the REST APIs and how we can extend the security and how to use and the REST APIs in the end server. So this is actually our, so for this demonstration, I'll be using the application management REST API. So this is our latest official documentation of the application management REST API. So yeah, yeah. so before explaining the security and stuff, so I, I will be explaining, so how we create the REST APIs. So almost so all our REST APIs are designed uh, basing um, using the Swagger first approach. So how we design the REST APIs is first we design the Swagger and then uh, develop the REST APIs. I mean, create the stops and develop the REST APIs. So all the APIs has Swagger definitions. So if you <coughs> go to the REST API documentation, so here you can download the Swagger definition. So we are currently using Open, a uh, open API tree version. So previous API we used the open API 2 version, the server 2 version. So you can download the API definition here. Yeah. And so this is about the application management REST API. So here this application management REST API is actually using for creating the service providers. All the applications in line server, creating, updating, uh, deleting, and also importing, exporting, those kind of uh, stuff we can do through the application management API. REST API. Uh, so, if you want to try this API, there are two ways I directly like can try. So, first one is we can uh, get the curl command using this official uh, documentation itself, or we can invoke to the postman. Direction. So I will be showing the both options. So I started a local ISO instance in my machine. So in local host and corporate report. So here I'm using the carbon super tenant. So I don't need to change it. The server URL is also same, the local host and corporate. Now I need to authorize. So I log out and my admin user is admin and that is for the carbon. And 
I will duplicate the system and from this. Then, if I want to get the all the applications of the system, so I can invoke this API, click on try it out. So I will leave this uh, the default. So you can uh, set parameters if you want. If you want to uh, limit and page name and filter in sort, we can use these parameters. So I will keep default and click execute. Then the curl command will be generated. So we can copy this one. And in the terminal line, so I will put minus k to skip the SSL location. Maybe some issue, let me check. The four zero one maybe my password is incorrect. Let me try again. And login. Reply. Admin at wsrp.com. Insert this admin. Enterprise. Execute. The command. Yeah, I get out of Maybe my password is incorrect. Yeah, so here you can see there are three applications registered. The first application means the portal application, and the other one means the local SP, and the other one means the support. So this is the first way that we can try using documentation. So the other one is we can download the Postman collection. So we can click on here. And so I already downloaded, so I don't try the important today. So you can click on the postman format, then uh, the version will be imported to your uh, the local postman application. So I'll open my application. So this is my postman application. So here you can see the postman collection. So if we want to list the applications, then you can use this API. So here you can see there are some Variables. So, if you want to set the default values to these variables, you can edit the workman collection and set the variables. So, these variables are correct by default, so I don't need to change. So, I'm using the local span to take the vote. I don't need to change. And authorization, you can set the basic authorization. And so, here you can see the same result. So that the application portal, local SPN is supported. So if you want to get more information regarding the particular application, you can use this self endpoint. So in the postman, I will copy this one and try the API. This one is with your application by ID. And so here I can paste that application ID. Instead, I can set the parameter here and try. Yeah, here yeah, I'm getting a four zero unauthorized, but in the authorization I haven't set. So I, I can inherit from the parent or I can check this code you know. So both will work. Yeah, so this is the response of the data application. So here you can see the claim mapping, the request of uh, 
claims, mandatory and stuff, and the subject claim URI, role claim URI, import protocol. So this application is configured as OIDC import protocol. And the how, what are the authenticators? So the basic authenticator is set for this application. Those informations are retrieved uh, to this test area, the response. Yeah, so those are the two ways that you can ignore and easily using the WC2 documentation. So uh, then we can just discuss about the I mean, security. So if you go to the documentation, you can see uh, the scopes required. So all the API, all the APIs uh, we have listed the scope that is required. Actually, so this can be configured to the identity XML. So if you go to the identity XML file, so this is my identity XML file. So here there's a tag called the resource control. So by default, all the requests that are coming to the IMS server will do, I mean, this uh, access control uh, is actually valid. So it access control valid, so all the requests are going to this valid. So by default, all the requests are denied. So if we want to allow some requests, we have to mention here and uh, uh, allow that one. So let's try a sample. I mean, uh, let's try a random endpoint. So here I'm trying, there's no such endpoint we define. So if we try that one, we get 401. So that's expected to charge. So if you want to allow this endpoint, we have to put a record in the center. So we can continue that through the deployment tone as well, but uh, again, it's the configuration should be added to the identity center. So this particular example, so I used these applications endpoint, get applications. So I can search it and so if I search it, so here this is the configuration related to that get. So you can see uh, this is the regex matches to the my endpoint and the API is secured and it's secured to get. So in order to invoke this API uh, with our access token, we need this internal application management view scope. So in IM server, this scopes can be binded to permissions. So these are internal scopes. These internal scopes are by default binding to the uh, permissions. And in server perspective, we can bind the scopes into permission or roles or any other uh, parameters. But uh, internal scopes are by default binding to the permissions. So these bindings can be found in under all the scope binding XML file. So that is besides in the repository font identity folder. So there we can search this scope. So this is the scope for so scope bindings. You can check. So this is scope is binded to the permission admin manage identity application admin view permission. That means uh, as a user who needs to you know who needs to view the application should have this permission. Then only he can get uh, access token with the internal application admin view permission and is. Uh, use the get access token to invoke the API. So let's check that one. So here I have created two users. The first one is Lionel at Yahoo.com, the other one is market.gmail.com. So if we check the roles of market.gmail.com, you can see that manager only is available for the bank. And if we check the permission of that, the application management delete and view all the application management permissions are assigned to the map. That means this user should be able to view the application. That means they should be able to invoke the API. So you can try out that. So you can get a token with the requested scope. So if it's a sample command, if you can get the token with the password content. So here you can see the username is mark at view.com and we request the internal application with permission is called. So if we try to remove that API, then we are getting the access token with the scope of 
little application view. So this access token is allowed to invoke the application. So we can go to the post one again and change the authentication from the zip code to the R token and use that access token. So if we use that one, yeah, we can get the response. So that means that access token is allowed to invoke this API. That user is allowed to invoke this API. So if you go to the other user, the line like yeah, the form, if we check the roles of that user, that user doesn't have any roles other than the internal level one. So if you go to permissions of internal level one, that doesn't have any uh, map permissions. So that means this user doesn't have that required permission. So if we try to get an access token for that user, so here we use that user with the scope of internal application management view, the same scope, but we get access token, but the scope is not associated for each other access token. That means we should not be able to use this access token to invoke the API. The authorization should be fair because the user doesn't have the required permissions. So if we use that access token to invoke the API. We are getting four zero three. That means that uh, user that the token is doesn't have doesn't well have the any scopes. That happens because uh, the user doesn't have the uh, required permissions. Yeah. So that is how the API is uh, uh, secured using the scopes. Uh, and so here I have actually discussed two ways of securing the APIs. So the first one is basic port, the other one is uh, port to the token. So those are not only the only ways that we can secure the APIs, we also can secure APIs using some other ways as well. So this is the default implementation. Uh, this is the implementation of uh, authentication mechanism. So you can find this implementation in the identity carbon test report. So here we have uh, five handlers out of the box. So these are the default authentication mechanism that we support. So the first one is the basic authentication handler. That's the username card password that we uh, try. The second one is the client authentication handler. Actually, this is uh, the application-based authentication mechanism that we develop so, uh, for our recovery and safe session applications. Um, and the third one is the client certificate based solution that's actually mutual SSL. And the other one is or to assess token handler. So that is uh, the O2 token, the other token based authentication handler. The other one is Tomcat cookie based authentication handler. That is actually used. So if we are logging to the management console, the session is maintained to the registration ID cookie. So we can use that cookie to authenticate the rest Yes. So this handler is written for that purpose. So if there is any custom requirement, we can write new handlers. So we can extend the, uh, extend the capability to support any custom requirements. So it's very easy to write custom handlers. So, so what we have to do is we have to extend the new handler with the authentication handler abstract class and write this uh, and get name with priority can handle and do authenticate methods. So how this authentication happened is, so here by default, we have five authenticators. So that means if there are only five authenticators, if there's a request coming to the IMS server, uh, it loops to all the authenticators and check who can handle the authentication request to the can handle method. So the can handle method will be invoked. And the authenticator says uh, the, the authenticator can handle the request. So if the authenticator returns, he can handle the, the that can handle the request, the new authenticate method of that authenticator will be called and the authenticator authentication happens. So if you are writing a new authentication handler, we have to be a, uh, we have to write the can handle method and do authenticate method uh, in the correct manner. So how it is happening in the basic authentication handler is in the basic authentication, uh, we are sending the authorization we are sending the basic authentication, the 64 encoded username and password in the authorization header with the basic parameters. So 
the, the can handle method check whether the the authorization header is present and it has the basic parameter with the uh, ratios. So that is the check that can handle method done in the basic authorization handler. So if if there is any request that is not relevant to uh, that, that, get, that cannot handle in the basic authentication handle, this is not false, then it goes to the next handle. handle. So if you have written this logic, then we have to register this handler as a host specific. So that can be done in the activator method. So, so this is the activator method in the existing um, handlers. So here you can see we have registered the basic communication handler, the two token handler, and all five handlers as source licenses. Yeah, so that's about so how to extend the authentication mechanism. So Satya will continue uh, with the other REST APIs that we support in the user portal and the admin portal. Yeah, Satya, yes, you want to share? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Isura. So, uh, so I'm Satya Bandara. I'm a senior software engineer in uh, WSD Identity Server. And uh, let me share my screen. Hope you can see my screen, right? Yes, yeah, Satya, yeah, we can see it. So, yeah. So, I hope you got a uh, uh, a brief understanding about the application management REST API through Isura's session. So in addition to managing the applications uh, from the application management API, we also have some uh, metadata endpoints through which uh, users can get information about the uh, some meta information that are specific or relevant to applications, for example, if a user wants to know about uh, the set of inbound protocols supported by identity server, then uh, they can query the meta inbound protocols endpoint. Likewise, uh, if it is required to uh, understand about the set of uh, adaptive authentication templates, uh, which can be configured out of the box, then we have the meta endpoint for adaptive authentication templates. So uh, that are some additional details about the application management REST API. So uh, uh, the next one is the approvals REST API. So uh, this approvals uh, REST API is uh, related to the workflow feature we have in the identity server. So if you are already familiar with the identity server, you may already know that we have a workflow feature uh, which can be used to configure human tasks uh, for uh, uh, to in order to associate approvals on uh, user related operations. So basically, this REST API is to retrieve the set of approval tasks uh, configured for a user. That means uh, uh, with this me endpoint, me approval task endpoint, uh, any authenticated user can identify whether there are any pending approvals under his name. And uh, then also we have a put API to uh, update the status of any corresponding approval tasks. So the status can be updated to one of these uh, options. Uh, they can claim the task, release the task, approve the task or reject the task. So that is about the workflow approvals API. Next, we have the uh, user associations API. This REST API is for associating user accounts. Uh, we have two contexts here, me context and the admin context. So using the me context, uh, the authenticated user can uh, create user associations uh, with any of the existing user account in the identity server. So using the me associations endpoint, uh, the authenticated user can associate himself to any local account in the server and using the me federated associations endpoint, he can uh, associate his account with a federated uh, uh, user account. 
similarly we have the uh, associations api in the under the admin context so here any privileged user can uh, do the associations on behalf of another user so for this also we have the associations and federated associations apis uh, the next one is the authorized apps api uh, this one is uh, related to the auth2 authorization flow so if you are familiar with the auth2 authorization flow uh, then you may know that uh, uh, for the authorization, you have to provide your consent to the uh, applications. So, using this authorized apps API, you can uh, you can uh, learn about what are the apps you have already provided uh, consent to. Uh, so, this is also available for the me context. That means only the authenticated user can uh, identify what are the apps he provided authorization to. And also, uh, they can uh, delete any consent given to uh, any application. So the next one is the challenge questions API. This is very much similar to the uh, so based challenge question API we had. So here also we can uh, do CRUD operations on challenge questions and uh, challenge answers. And uh, here also we have two contexts any authenticated user can uh, update their challenge questions and answers and also any admin user can uh, uh, can uh, uh, update the challenge answers of a user on behalf of that user uh, so that is about the challenge questions api and the, next we have the claim management api for managing the claim dialects and uh, claims external claims and local claims in the server so we support post get put delete operations on claim dialects and uh, local claims as well as uh, external claims uh, the next api that we have uh, newly introduced it is the email template management api so using this API, uh, you can uh, configure email template types and uh, email templates for any uh, email template type. So email template types are basically, uh, basically you can retrieve the set of uh, default email template types that we have in the server. Uh, account confirmation is, uh, is an example of email template type and also you can configure any custom email templates types using the uh, host operation that we have supported and uh, base uh, for any of the email template types we can you can configure email templates so templates are uh, uniquely identified by the locale so here if we take this email template uh, email template so here uh, we have the locale as uh, enus so similarly, uh, if you want to configure any additional locales, then you can uh, do a post operation on the email template, uh, templates API. So for both email template types and email templates, we support uh, the these CRUD operations, post, get, put, and delete. Uh, the next one is the FIDO2 REST API, this is for FIDO2 device registration. Uh, so using this API, users can register or deregister FIDO2 devices. And also they can uh, re uh, retrieve device metadata uh, using the device metadata API. So basically for device registration, we have provided two APIs. One is the start registration API and uh, the other one you can start registration without a username. Uh, and we have a delete operation on uh, FIDO2 API for deregistering devices by providing the credential ID and username. And uh, we can update the display name of a device uh, by using the patch operation. Uh, the next one is the identity governance API. So uh, if you are familiar with the identity server management console, uh, you know that we have a set of 
identity governance features on the, under resident identity provider. So password policies, consent management, analytics engine, login policies, those are some of the uh, identity governance features we have. So those features can be categorized into uh, five main categories like password policies, login policies, account management policies, consent management and analytics engine. So under each of these category, uh, we have governance connectors. For example, for password history, uh, we, have a we have a governance connector in the backend. And uh, similarly for other categories also, we have governance connectors. So basically in from this API, we have provided a, a RESTful uh, API to retrieve the set of governance connectors in the server and also uh, each governance connector has a set of properties. So we have provided a patch operation on each governance connector to update uh, the property values. For example, if you want to update the uh, account suspension notification enable field to false, then you can simply send a patch request to the corresponding connect ID. You can get the connect ID by calling a get request to the identity governance endpoint and then you can send a patch request to that corresponding connect ID. And uh, the next one is the identity providers API. So this is very much similar to the applications API. Uh, you can do all the CRUD operations on identity providers. Here also we have a metadata API. So using the metadata API, you can retrieve uh, details about details relevant to the identity providers. For example, using the Meta Federated Authenticators API, you can learn about uh, what are the supported federated authenticators in the identity server. Uh, and uh, similarly, we have uh, a Meta API for the outbound provisioning connectors. So by invoking outbound provisioning connector Meta endpoint, you can learn about uh, the set of outbound provisioning connector supported by the identity server. So you, you have to basically get the connector ID from the meta endpoint. And when you want to create an identity provider, you have to specify the corresponding ID. And uh, similar to that, uh, we have Uh, we have a separate sub resource for uh, managing the federated authenticators of a identity provider. And uh, we have a provisioning sub resource for managing uh, provisioning related uh, things in the identity provider. For example, using the uh, JIT provisioning, you can update the just in time provisioning configuration and uh, outbound connectors, you can update or retrieve outbound provisioning connect information. And uh, similarly, we have the claims endpoint for uh, managing the claim configuration of an identity provider and roles API for managing the role configuration of an identity provider. And uh, this is uh, this connected apps API, is something new that we introduced uh, using the connected apps API, uh, you, can, uh, you can retrieve what are the applications that are connected to this identity provider? That means uh, the set of this will return the set of ident uh, set of applications that have this identity provider configured in their authentication flow. So that is about the identity providers API. And next we have the key store management API. Uh, using the key store management API, you can uh, retrieve. Uh, the certificates in uh, our private key store and you can retrieve the public certificate of our key store and using the client search endpoint you can uh, retrieve the list of certificates in the client trust store. Next one is the O2 scope management API. Uh, uh, using the O2 scope management API, you can uh, do CRUD operations on O2 scopes. So basically you can create new scopes in the server and you can retrieve, delete, update scopes by their uh, name. So basically when you add a new scope, you have to specify a scope binding uh, this scope binding can be a role or a permission. 
and you can specify an array of scope bindings also. So you can have multiple scope bindings. And uh, yeah, that is about port two scopes. And uh, OIDC scope is a uh, is a, a subcategory of O2 scopes. That means OIDC scopes are specifically used in the OIDC flow. So based, uh, using the OIDC scopes endpoint, you can retrieve and uh, manage OIDC scopes. Uh, next, you have the permission management API. Uh, using the permission management API, uh, basically we have a single API here using the permissions API. You can retrieve the list of permissions that are supported by the identity server. You can retrieve it as an array, uh, as a list. So you have the display name of a permission and the resource path of uh, the permissions. Uh, the next one that we have introduced is the script libraries API. So this one is uh, associated with the uh, authentication scripts. Uh, you can uh, you can add new script libraries and uh, retrieve existing script libraries. Uh, this is uh, relevant to the adaptive authentication feature we have. And similarly, we have the secondary user store API. Uh, using the secondary user store API, you can manage the secondary user stores in the server. And there also we have a meta API. Using, using which you can uh, learn about uh, what are the supported user store managers in the server. So basically uh, you have to get the uh, corresponding type of a user store manager type ID from the meta endpoint. And when you create a user store, you have to uh, specify the user store type ID to uh, specify what is the user store manager uh this user store is uh, uh is uh, related to and uh, here also we have a test connection this is uh, this is very much similar to the test connection feature we have in the um, in our identity server management console you can uh, you can call this api and check whether uh, the connection is uh, correctly established to the underlying uh, uh, underlying user store However, this is only supported for JDB users, user stores uh, for now. Uh, so that is about the secondary user stores. And uh, next we have the session management API. Uh, using the session management API, uh, here also we have two contexts, uh, me context and admin context. Uh, uh, using this session management API, any user can learn about uh, what are the active sessions uh, of that user in the server. So using the me endpoint, users can learn about uh, uh, the active sessions of the current authenticated user and uh, using the admin uh, set of admin APIs, any privileged user can uh, retrieve or terminate the sessions of uh, another user. Uh, so the last API that we have is the uh, user discoverable application management REST API. So uh, this discoverability feature is something we introduced uh, with Python 0 onwards. So for any application, uh, the application owner can specify whether that uh, application can be discoverable or not by other users. So if that application is specified as discoverable, uh, then uh, when using this API, uh, the authenticated user can check what are the uh, applications that are visible to him. And uh, yeah, that is uh, yeah that is a brief introduction about uh, some of the uh, new REST APIs that we introduced with 5.10 onwards. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Yeah, uh, thanks, Satya. I guess uh, there were questions and they were answered on the chat itself by uh, Maliti and others. Uh, so I think that concludes our June uh, IAM community call. Uh, the next one is on uh, 30th July. I uh, hope uh, you'll join that too. 
and once again uh, apologize for uh, the uh, the mishap uh, happened uh, at the start of the call there are some technical issues and uh, thank you satya and isura and maliti uh, uh, joining uh, from colombo and uh, doing this session and uh, thanks a lot everyone for joining and looking forward to meet you again in our next uh, next month uh, iim community thank you